Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having an unbelievable start to your weekend. Uh, you guys should be aware, if you're not, that we are doing a fundraiser booster uh, to push a drive for support. Uh, the goal this week, and it's for the remainder of the weekend, as it stands now, is to raise $10,000 by tomorrow at midnight. Uh, we do have a, a contributor on board. We received our first $30 yesterday. That's it. But I am excited. I am uh, believing that we're going to do something and it's so necessary. What I want to do here is not spend a whole lot of time begging you for support. Uh, I believe that that has to come from inside. I believe that you have to see uh, the value in what you're doing. And so what I want to share is something I think is extremely important. You have heard me say for years that one of the reasons that we are constantly in last place, we are constantly maligned, we are constantly manipulated, oppressed, mishandled, uh, misguided, and so much more is because we don't understand how things work. So what I want to do today is I want to share with you some things that I have developed and discovered and am passionate about uh, over the course of the last 30 years that drive what I do in the community and why it's so important. Some of the current reality, some of the current crises that we are in and why we need to be actively engaged in dealing with this. We are in a state of crisis and I am not overstating that. I am simply stating what the facts reveal and we tend to want to pretend we want to uh, function under the illusion or delusion that we are gaining ground, that we are doing well when all of the data shows otherwise. Show me the facts. Show me where we're making moves and show, we, show me where we are struggling or show me where we are measured. And in everywhere where we are measured, we are in regression. We are actually worse than we were 50, 60 years ago, and you have to ask yourself why. Now, the optics look better. We're driving Mercedes. We're doing all these different things, but we're in deeper debt. We still haven't increased in any way in home ownership. We do not have the ability to close the wealth gap. In fact, that's why I think the prison population is growing predominantly um, sourced by us. Uh, we make up 6% of the population, but 40% of the prison population as males that's an issue uh, and I can go on and on but I want to talk to you specifically about some things and how this stuff comes about uh, understanding how things work instead of just complaining about the results is what we need so I'm gonna to talk to you about some things that are going on and what we need to do and why we need to do it and I'm gonna do it as quickly as I possibly can but I don't want to rob it of its substance so I'm gonna go at it uh, and that's another thing we got to do we got to get out of this uh, soundbite thing you know if I can't get it in three minutes I don't want it it's been years of oppression, years of trauma, years of suffering, years of miseducation, years of mass incarceration, uh, 246 years of child slavery and everything else that followed. You're not going to see something in three minutes and get it figured out. It's going to take years and years of literally investing yourself in something that you become powerful enough, knowledgeable enough, aware enough to actually be an instrument of change, an instrument of empowerment. And that should be your goal. Your goal should be to be an instrument of change, empowerment, an instrument of direction and a symbol of hope for your people. And if that's not where you're at, then that's a problem. I'm just going to sit up and say it's time to stop sitting up and wallowing in their system, pretending that we have arrived when we are tip uh, almost always are simply being utilized to create a, uh, a an idea or an image that there's no more racism in this country when we know for a fact that it is. And most of our people are suffering, suffering heavily under it while we pretend because we're a little bit better off than they are. Uh, so I'm going to get into some of this stuff. Uh, and I, I made it out like, because you know me, I could talk all day. I've been doing this all my life, so I could literally talk all day. And, and I can go everywhere and all over the place. And so I want it to be very structured in this because I want to get through it and I want to make sure it's touched. First thing I'm going to touch on is the black family. To me, the black family is the foundation of building power. 
it is the foundation of the community it is the foundation of what's necessary it is the institution in which we prepare and empower our youth to go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and not only compete but win and so what do we build the family on we build the family on an, an on another foundation the marriage the marriage is suffering i did an entire video on, on that on i believe yesterday yesterday or the day before go check that video out and uh, look at it in depth. I went through it in depth and I want you to see it in depth. I can't go through it all here. But this is the thing. They've engineered division between black men and black women in a number of different ways. We have participated in it in our behavior. We have participated in it in uh, the way we've behaved with one another, the way we are acting towards one another right now, the way we refuse to be accountable for our own situations, our own actions, and the unwillingness to work through the differences so that we can recover what we have lost that's important uh the attack on black masculinity there is an ongoing attack on black masculinity uh using a number of different concepts including toxic masculinity which is absolutely impossible uh to have toxic masculinity i've explained this before masculinity in its very nature in its very definition is positive you cannot have toxic masculinity you can have someone who is having toxic behavior and so what they've defined what they've done is they've taken anything that a man does especially a black man that is negative that is destructive that is un dishonorable and they put toxic in front of masculinity that's not masculine any type of behavior that harms any type of behavior that refuses to protect provide to cover uh to lead uh to be a shield isn't masculine the very nature of masculinity is to provide to protect to cover and so if it's not those things then it's not masculinity just because it comes from a man doesn't mean it's masculine so then we need to understand that uh, we need to learn and do the things that are important to restoring the family. And that comes from creating an environment that values the family, working to create instruments of engagement. We are constantly being bombarded by information that demeans, that devalues the marriage, that demeans, that devalues black manhood, that demeans, that devalues black womanhood, that demeans, that devalues the connectivity and unity of blacks that drives competition between blacks that creates cattiness between women competition between our men and this constant brawl between us that keeps us at odd and keeps us at bay that's our responsibility to work on uh building strong youth oh man i've touched on this on a couple of books uh my 19th book born in captivity i go into multi-generational trauma i go into the attack on our young boys i go into uh the attack on the family i go into uh, a number of different things adverse childhood experiences so many different things uh book number 19 i'm telling you that um and you can see this isn't some short treatise this is hard work research and i'm going to get to some things that should wake you up it's so important because we're not protecting our boys and i talked about that in academic apart time which is apartheid which was my 24th book and it's focused on the disproportionality of special education referrals where they are hurting our young black boys into uh, a tunnel of disproportionality aimed at special education referrals ieps in which they get extra money in the school for each kid that they diagnose with the need for an IEP and predominant diagnosis on these are either ADHD or oppositional defiant disorder, both of which can be medicated and managed by the use of psychotropic drugs that are Schedule II drugs. If you don't understand how schedules work, uh, the lower the number on the schedule, the higher the addiction, uh, proclivity to addiction and damage, and the uh, less like it has any medicinal uses. Schedule 1 is the worst. Schedule 2 is the next worst, and it's highly addictive, very few medicinal uses. You have to understand that most of these drugs are actually stimulants that have a reverse effect on hyperactive uh, minds. So they tend to calm them down, but they make them docile. They change chemical makeups in the brain. The most important thing is they are what? 
addictive. So they are causing rapid firing of dopamine or rapid firing of certain neurotransmitters that are in turn destroying neuroreceptors that are in turn creating addiction that is in turn creating a problem now the thing is these same uh, stimulants are literally one molecule one molecule off from being cocaine so now it's interesting because this thing that they're pumping our boys with is the very thing that's got their dads in jail same thing one's legal one's made illegal they both are having the same impact and damaging force on us um then uh, they're in this thing. So as early as five, these young boys are being alienated in the school process, alienated in the educational and academic process to where uh, the older they get, the more they feel they don't belong. They don't have a place. They're not wanted. They're not like they don't fit in. So what happens when someone feels that way? They tend to want to remove themselves. So you have a high dropout rate. Here's the problem. The high dropout rate increases their likelihood of becoming incarcerated. This is called the school to prison pipeline. We are literally preparing you for prison as early as five years old by alienating you from the very process that should be preparing you to be successful in life. And it's our responsibility to actually address that. Um, I also addressed it in my 16th book, uh, The Miseducation of Black Youth in America. Uh, maneuvering on the grand chessboard of life uh, we are literally being miseducated out of our quest our desire our goal of empowerment we have mistakenly identified the public education system or the traditional education system as a means of empowerment when in truth it is a means of subjugation most people are being educated regardless of race to what work for someone else that is not how you build wealth now that may be how you start but you you build wealth by owning you build wealth by having something the thing is you can have a six-figure job you can have a seven-figure job but if that is all you have, the moment that you pass away, the job goes to someone else. It can't be passed down. So you only have what you built with the seven figures over the course of your time earning it versus if you actually create a business that earns six figures, but it's yours and you create value within the business that doesn't require you to be present for the value to be present. Now you have something you can pass down to your offspring something that can give them a foot footing that they that you didn't start with but that's what education is doing and it's our responsibility to effectively and properly and appropriately educate and socialize our children so now let's get into what we need to do to protect our daughters because this is where it gets real scary for me this is where we have a major crisis and this is one of the things that we have over the last five years really truly amped up our engagement in in research in uh, program development and direct community involvement and that is in mental health with uh, an issue i want to talk specifically first about protecting our daughter that's a strike that's a drastic spike in suicide attempts and it is predominant in younger groups let me tell you something ages 5 to 11 where blacks only make up 15 percent of the youth population there is a 30 percent representation in suicides over the last eight years so we only make up 15 percent of the population but we over double our that representation in actual suicides the old adage blacks don't commit suicide is completely out the freaking window right now it's been out for a while it's time to get really truly aware of what's going on we're losing our babies we're losing so many different people and it's happening across board boys and gentlemen. but i'll talk about our baby girls for a minute now here's the thing this isn't the worst. This is from the American Psychi Psychiatric Association, the Focus Journal on Psychiatry, American Psychological Association. I've reviewed over 100 different uh, studies on suicide and mental health, uh, specifically focusing on racial uh, disparities and variations. And we are in a crisis as a race. The only ones doing worse as far as shifts and growth. Uh, obviously, more white people are dying from suicide. There are more white people. But when we talk about representation based on your demographic representation, the only ones doing worse are Native Americans. They're dying at a, you know, they're committing suicide at a higher rate. Except for, here we go, 
ages 5 to 11, 15 percent of the youth population we represent 13 percent of the suicides but this isn't it the most alarming thing is that in this drastic spike is a 131 percent 131.5 percent increase a 131.5 percent increase that's a massive spike there's no spike that matches that it's and then this is ages 5 to 11 and the predominant gender are girls and this is interesting because traditionally men are 80 percent more likely to commit suicide than women but we're seeing this phenomenon in our baby girls ages 5 to 11 and some of some of the studies are take you from 5 to 13 or 10 to 13 but in either of those categories 5 to 11 5 to 13 10 to 13 we're finding that young black girls are at the number one spot uh, you, you could have never told us 20 years ago that blacks would actually lead a statistical category in suicide, but we're leading it. We're also leading in a couple of statistical categories in growth uh, or, or growth of rate. And so we're looking at it. And here's another thing that was a 49 percent spike for black males over the last what seven years uh, for ages 14 to 24. 49 percent spike. 49% increase. Uh, I mean, that's beyond statistical significance. That's absolutely epidemic crisis level, and we're not examining it. We're not putting energy and effort to it. I've been uh, researching it for years. I've been talking about it for years. I've been writing on it for years. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, we've and, and we've had some great work. I want to, you know, I, I, I've been studying our greats for years. Um, Dr. Franz Fanon in the uh, 1950s, Dr. Naeem Akbar in the 80s, the 90s, and, and current, uh, Dr. Um, Francis Cress Welsing, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, up until she passed away a few years ago, um, Dr. Joy DeGru, last couple of decades, um, Dr. Amos Wilson, oh my God. Uh, Dr. Welsing is literally the reason why I chose psychology over law. Uh, her her representation of her work and defense of her work on the Phil Donahue show in 1985 against white quote unquote uh, scholars uh, is legendary and I got to see it live uh, when I was in high school and it just changed the entire trajectory it gave me so much pride in my blackness but it gave me so much passion to learn what is going on with us why not only why we behave the way we behave, but why they behave the way they behave and what we must do in order to do this. So I, I, I devoted myself to being a problem solver, to being a part of the solution, to presenting answers instead of complaints. And I will continue to do that as long as I have breath in my body. Um, then we go on and we, we talk about a number of other different things. Um, and then I'm going to be done. I want to, uh, no, my 23rd book, The Undoing of the African American Mind, is an introduction uh, to one of my theories, which is the cognitive, uh, collective cognitive bias reality syndrome. Um, and it is a theory that suggests that based on our experiences, holistically, generationally, we are literally epigenetically and uh, through social learning theory passing down this bias of our reality that really pushes us into easy subjugation. We tend to see things in a way that it was meant for us to see to benefit them versus the way we should see it. We have a bias bent towards serving their purposes and interests, interests versus our own. And it is literally programmed into our mind. It is literally reinforced through our experiences. And we aren't challenging it the way we need to. And that's something that's really proved. Uh, it goes into multi-generational trauma. Um, here is, and I've shown this, this before, but um, a few uh, months back, I did a workshop with the Harris County uh, Sheriff's Office, Wellspring um, Psychiatric Clinic, on epigenetics epigenetics is a an area of science that studies uh how environment and experiences 
influence genetic performance. And it is one of the ways I how I discovered it was actually doing my work on multi-generational trauma. How is trauma passed down? And one of the ways it's passed down is literally genetically. It's literally passed uh, when uh, the male brings his 23 chromosomes and the female brings her 23 chromosomes to create the 46 chromosomes that becomes the new uh, ovum and uh, uh, ultimately the fetus and ultimately the child. Uh, there are genetic tags that can be passed along that are trauma. Uh, trauma. These epigenetic tags literally carry the memory of the trauma from the parent and literally can be passed down. So literally it can physiologically be passed down, but also environmental stresses. And what this epigenetics talks about is something uh, within the realm of epigenetics called adverse childhood experiences. How uh, certain experiences as a child, and they are, they are in different viruses, the 10 most uh, prevalent uh, ACEs, as we call them, adverse child experiences. Each one counts as a point. The most prevalent is physical abuse, uh, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, an alcoholic parent. It includes also uh, so other um, ad uh, chemical addictions, an incarcerated family member, uh, the disappearance of a parent through divorce, death of, or abandonment, a family member diagnosed with a mental illness, and a mother who is a victim of domestic violence. Now, where it gets interesting in this particular thing is for each adverse childhood experience, there is a compounded long-term physiological health impact implication so it's not just the psychological implications that come with the trauma it's the physiological outcomes that come with the trauma that go into adulthood throughout life so what are some of the physiological outcomes well a child with four aces and we can start looking at some of the things that are playing out and some of the other things i share a child with four aces meaning that there are four out of those ten and there are others so it can be four that aren't listed but still traumatic experiences. But those are the most prevalent. Those show to have the most uh, uh, egregious impacts over the course of life. So with four, a score of four, a child is 12 times more likely to attempt suicide over the course of their life. They are two and a half times more likely to develop uh, certain physiological uh, situations like diabetes they are four times more likely to dis develop ischemic heart disease become obese ischemic heart disease is the number one killer in america and it's that they're four times more likely to develop cancer we find mm -hmm. out in the study of epigenetics that one of the um primary influences on cancer isn't carcinogens while they do play a role, it isn't your diet. While it does play a role, the most powerful influence on whether or not you develop cancer is stress. Environmental stress turns on cancer genes or what we call upregulates. So the upregulation of cancer genes while simultaneously downregulating the immune system, the genes that literally are designed to fight off illnesses and maladaptations now down regulated to the point of maybe even being completely turned off genes uh that are destructive cancer genes and other you know autoimmune diseases and so many other things turned on now you have cancer that's why you're he hearing a lot in the homeopathic and naturopathic world about people healing themselves why they're learning how to manage stress mentally, emotionally, environmentally, uh, through decision making and so many other things. And no one, no other group uh, in this country, maybe with the historic exception of Native Americans, can come close. And they can't come close because there was no chattel slavery with them. They were being slaughtered. They were definitely being killed. They went through uh, some pretty uh, scary stuff. But... There's no group that has had historical stress at the level we have. And uh, all of this stuff and this research started with me as far as uh, the study of multi-generational trauma started with me because of the argument uh, back in the 90s. Well, it's been 130, what was it, 120, 130 years since slavery. Let it go. It's time to get over it. Now, you'll never see anyone tell um, a Jewish descendant of the Holocaust to get over it. 
while they fared a lot better, but number one is they put in and invested money into the research to understand some of the psychological uh, implications that were uh, prevalent in, in the early stages. They started to see some things and there were some crazy reports. That's what got me into epigenetics is they were literally having situations where grandchildren of Holocaust survivors that weren't even born at the time that the Holocaust took place and had not been given detail, uh, given any detailed uh explanation into what their grandparents went through were having dreams that were highly visual and accurate to the experience and this stuff started popping up so they started to study it and this is where we start to realize that you're you're literally your cells carry many uh memories dr basil van der Kolk, probably the foremost expert in trauma uh, wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score, but he has written so many papers. You can't do a real true study on trauma and not come across his name. And one of the things that he talked about is how the cell stores the memory. The body remembers. So actually, when you are re when you are having a episode, so to speak, you're not remembering it. You're reliving it. It is the exact same experience, the smell, the feel, um, breaking out in sweats. And it's not something you control until you learn how to manage and deal with the trauma. Well, here's the thing. We went through 246 years of chattel slavery, the most brutal form of slavery ever known in history. They can talk all day long like slavery has always existed, not like we experienced it here in the Americas and in the Caribbean. No, not even close. So then you have 246 years of that. Then they say, okay, you're free. But then they give you 12 years of construction where you're pretty much trapped in the South because people in the North don't want you. Uh, states like Oregon were uh, whipping 30 lashes of blacks that are caught in the state in more than 30 days. And so there were very few places that you could go. So you got 2 million plus black people in the South with nowhere to go. They then And, and then during this 12 year period of reconstruction, they are literally rebuilding the antebellum South and returning it to its glory. The only difference was they weren't calling it slavery, but they had convict leasing. Convict leasing was they made things like vagrancy and homelessness a, a felony, meaning that if you couldn't, if you didn't have a job in a place to stay, you could be arrested and charged with a felony and imprisoned. Well, it's kind of hard to find a job and get a place to stay when there are the black codes. The black codes were these things that said you couldn't own land, you couldn't do X, Y, Z, you couldn't get jobs in these particular areas and things. Why? Because you own the expertise. You're the one that's been doing it for the last 200 years. You're the one that's best equipped to do it, and that would put whites out of work. So you can't do it. So then you got arrested and then you got leased out to the people who needed the work done as an as a a convict. It is legal to put you to work, especially then without paying you. So then they leased them out to the very plantation they had been freed from to the railroad companies, to the road builders and, and on and on and on construction companies. They leased them out. And, and so we going through that we went through 75 years of Jim Crow segregation. Uh, a brutal time where you were more likely to be lynched then than you were as a slave. But somewhere we were supposed to heal in that without ever getting any type of psychiatric or psychological intervention, we were supposed to heal. So this whole epigenetics thing, it goes deep and I'll actually be doing another workshop with the parents. I did it with the parents. I did it with intake. I did it with the sheriff's department and everybody the last time. This time we're going to do it specifically with the parents because they're the ones that are struggling with children. Uh, they're the ones struggling with uh, family being locked up and so many other things. This adverse childhood experiences thing needs to really truly be examined in a more in-depth manner. I'm doing everything I can as an individual. Um, I'm championing it as, as much as I possibly can, but there's so much work to be done um, look we're in crisis there's no way around this conversation we're in crisis and I, I don't mean that in any casual sense I mean that we're losing babies we're losing ground we're losing relevance because we are systematically being replaced by Latinos uh, this isn't some natural occurrence. This is systematically engineered. It is being done on purpose. And we are none the wiser. We are moving around predominantly with our heads buried in the sand. And we are expecting 
some kind of miraculous rescue. We're thinking because we are, quote, unquote, the chosen people, because we are, quote, unquote, the original people, because we have an unbelievable ability to be creative and produce things, and that we are in so many ways brilliant beyond measure that all of a sudden we are going to magically come out of this. No, we have to take all of those things that I just mentioned and actually activate them and put them into motion and apply them to the problems and be consistent in our energy and our effort and our focus if we're ever going to actually overcome this. So when I tell you we need to raise funds, it's not because I want to go out and play. I, I run a business with multiple companies within it. And that's how I literally get this stuff done. But I'm still going to be limited because I'm building something for my family and I'm not going to hamstring my family to fight for something nobody else is willing to fight for. I'm going to fight for it the best I can. I'm never going to put the mantle down, but I'm going to challenge people. Imagine if I am doing what I'm doing. If 10 people came and said, I'm committing one thousand dollars to you doing it or I'm committing one thousand dollars a year to you doing it. It's not going to go anywhere close to what we spend a year, but it takes a little bit more off of us and adds a little bit more force to what we're doing. Imagine if 20 people did it. Imagine if 100 people say, I'll give $100. The thing is, we have an uncanny ability to sit around and watch what needs to be done and know it needs to be done and believes it needs to be done and see the people who are doing it and commend the people who are doing it but won't support them. If it wasn't for Amari Stoudemire, we would be raising a GoFundMe to bury Dr. Yosef Benyakinen. That blew my... I haven't recovered for that one. Thank God for uh, Amari Stoudemire, NBA basketball player, uh, who stepped up and paid for his service. He's not the only one. You don't have your greats, your master teachers, coming and giving you this. You sucking it up, using it as argumentative um, ammunition uh, to elevate your self-esteem or your position or your place but really not applying what's really being presented in any grand scheme to do anything to elevate your people. See, every last one of those people, Dr. Yosef ben uh, Dr. Chancellor Williams, Dr. Naeem Abbar, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson, Dr. Amos Wilson, uh, Dr. John Howard Clark, and I can go on and on uh, of these great, unbelievable minds. They didn't do it for the money. They didn't do it for... Uh, claim to fame, they did it because they were trying to empower us. They wanted us to take the mantle and run with it and expand it. They, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's why I tell people all the time, we spend so much time praising Malcolm Martin, uh, uh, Marcus, and, and, and all those guys and what they did in the 60s and, and for Marcus earlier. Uh, we, we spend so much time praising them that nobody is doing the work now. We've made heroes and icons out of them, and that was never their goal. They were never there, and they were never trying to be icons. They were trying to be the bridge. They were trying to pass a baton. They were trying to give you enough to know what to do to take it to the next level. My goal is when I look at what I've learned from Dr. Amos, from Franz Fanon, from Dr. Welsing, from Dr. Naeem Agba, from Dr. Joe Adegrove, from Dr. Howard Stevenson, and on and on, these great minds within the field that I operate in, what I look at is how further can I take it? What can I do to expand on it? What can I pass on to the next mind that's willing to be invested in it uh, in totality to produce something that our people can consume and expand? Some of you are going to be actual and engaged in it. Some of you are going to be the people who fund it. Some of you are going to be the minds who come together and collaborate some of you are going to be warriors. 
but we all need to be moving and doing something. So again, the goal this, this weekend is $10,000. The links that show you how you can give are in the description box. This is my challenge to you. Let's hit this goal. I've shown you just a little bit of what I've been doing. Uh, you can always go to the organization's website and see the full force of what we've been doing and what we are trying to do. And look at the work is there. So you, 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 you see it, you, it had to come from somewhere. You know, it didn't just magically appear. Now the thing is, what are we going to do with it? Here's the last thing and I'm done. We've got to get out of this notion of being entertained. Some of the most intensively nurturing content and information and instruction won't be sensational. It won't get you excited. It won't make you laugh. It won't make you dance. But it will literally give you the nurturing that you need to live, expand, grow, and become powerful. Stop looking to be entertained. Stop talking about, well, it's so, some of the most boring stuff that I've ever encountered has been the most life changing. But I came into it searching it for the purpose of change, not being entertained. So the fact that it was, uh, monotonous at time the fact that it was monotone at time look, look you want to be entertained go to a movie go to a concert you want to be fair go to the people with the knowledge who are disseminating the knowledge every now and then you'll get an entertainer that can do it and you'll get entertained and get the knowledge but you can't sit up and rest your hat on that so again you know i'm not going to spend a whole lot of money on creating production it defeats the purpose. I'm going to spend a whole lot of money on production to get you to watch stuff that you're not acting on. Show me you're acting on it, get enough to it, and maybe the content production and presentation will improve because there may be something there for that. But for me to sit up and just do it, seeing the history of what's going on, I'm going to keep feeding because this stuff is out there. What I've created is out there. It's out there all over the internet, not just on the platform you're watching it on now. It's out there. It's in books. It's in articles. It's in videos. It's in lectures. It's in interviews. And I'll keep doing it because it's my passion and my love. But I could do so much more. I could resource so much more. I could collaborate so much more if you would support it. So again, Here's your opportunity to do so. Look in the description box. Make it happen. On that note, look, I'm out of here. You guys, thank you for letting me take up your time. Have a great weekend.